Uh, thank you, Carl. Carl is my next door neighbor, brand new to the neighborhood, so I'm doing everything I can to help acclimate him to uh, Ann Arbor and to Fair Street. I like to tell people I live on Fair Street as in fair and unfair instead of art fair uh, so that they will remember that I'm on the fair side of things. But uh, I'm happy, I'm very happy to be here and so happy to see so many of you taking a moment away from your desks your lunches. I went to the cafeteria here at Google. That was phenomenal. And all of the opportunities you have to do almost anything but sit and listen to a federal judge yammer on. See, most of the people who come to see and meet with me have no choice in the matter. <laughs> Many are shackled and have fancy escorts in nice uniforms. <laughs> and others are pleading with me to grant whatever relief they may be thinking is appropriate for their case. But all of you, I presume, are here of your own free will. And if not, please see me afterwards and I'll <laughs> see what I can do. So seriously, thank you so much for being here. I'd like to begin, actually, by welcoming all of you to Ann Arbor, who may be relatively new here. It's a wonderful town and a great place to live. I moved here uh, before I knew anything about the internet, nothing about search engines, advertising markets, and this was back in 1978. I came here to complete my undergraduate education, and that's, for the most part, the story I told my parents. But what I really came here to do was to meet gay people, and that was the purpose of my destination. Now, most of you would be thinking right now, what was she thinking? We are in the Rust Belt. She could have gone to San Francisco. She could have gone to New York City. Any of these places might have been a smarter place for my real purpose. But I was born and raised in Bloomington, Indiana, and I'm a Midwest girl through and through. So I found a home here in Ann Arbor, and I have never left. Once I arrived in Ann Arbor in 78, I, I attended the University of Michigan uh, to complete my undergraduate education. But I also undertook what was sometimes hard work of coming out as a lesbian. I had begun doing that in a small college town in Ohio, but I felt suffocated, isolated, and uncertain about how to survive there. Ann Arbor at the time had a very small lesbian-run bookstore upstairs from where the Birkenstock store is right now on 4th Avenue across from the co-op. Upstairs used to be a bookstore called Woman's Space. If any of you have seen Portlandia, it's not <laughs> <laughs> okay, then you know sort of what I'm talking about. But it was not even quite that up and coming. Uh, so Ann Arbor also had on 4th Avenue two gay bars. One was called The Flame, and it's where Logan Restaurant is, very nice up and coming restaurant. Well, The Flame was not quite like that. It was dark, it was musty, it was moldy, and it gave you this sense of, my God, is this what my life is about? But we still went there. The other was a dance bar uh, not far from where the current YMCA is. But I have already digressed from my story. Uh, so my story starts with, with this. I believe I am one of the lucky ones back in those days. I had grown up as the daughter of a child survivor of the Holocaust, a German immigrant, my mother, and a survivor of the mean streets of Patterson, New Jersey, my father. We were one of the few Jewish families in Bloomington, Indiana in the 50s, and that would not be true today. Bloomington is a more cosmopolitan, it's not quite Ann Arbor, it's not San Francisco, but, uh, but back then it was a very isolating place uh, for Jewish families to be. As a result, I always felt like I was other in school and in my neighborhood. Our neighbors didn't like Jewish people, the lofts were their name, and they called the police if my brother and sister and I or our dog set foot on their lawn. And you can imagine the dares that my brother and sister and I had to one another to <laughs> run through their lawn when our parents were not watching. When I went off to college in 1976 and came to fully understand and embrace that I was a lesbian, I did not suffer the way many people did and still do today. 
That's why I say I was one of the lucky ones. I had already felt different from my peers, and I was used to that. It was part of who I was and what I understood about the world. I was also a skinny, awkward kid who was ticklish and giggly and not all that concerned with fitting in. I, was, I wasn't afraid of losing status or jobs or any of those things that so many people worry about. I had never felt confident that those things would be mine in the first place. So I arrived in Ann Arbor in 1978 and set about my mission of coming out and completing my college education. Somewhere along the way in those early years, I got distracted, and I've got a couple of my law clerks and an intern here, and they can tell you I get distracted pretty quickly. Um, and this particular distraction brought me in the direction of becoming a community organizer for lesbian and gay rights. Uh, not as a paid position. Now you hear President Obama was a community organizer, and we all think that's good. Well, uh, it wasn't looked upon quite so favorably at the time. Uh, but I, I did uh, this work in all of the free time that I could find. And from there I was drawn to looking at the labor movement as a vehicle for social change, in particular for women. I helped try to organize a union for clerical workers at the University of Michigan. There were over 3,000 secretaries and uh, we tried to organize a union and were unsuccessful by about 15 votes out of all those. Uh, clericals. But as a result of that, I decided to run for union steward at the University of Michigan Hospital where I had a part-time and later full-time position uh, cleaning uh, patient rooms, working in the cafeteria. Uh, through that, I, and I just got that work to support myself uh, going to school. Um, but I was elected to that position as a union steward, and some years later I ran to become the full-time chief negotiator for the University of Michigan Service and Maintenance employees. So finally at that time I was a full-time paid troublemaker. <laughs> but as time marched on and I grew older, I wanted to have a family. Back in 1984 I met someone I would fall in love with and have a non-legal marriage to in 1989. We raised three children together, and finally we were married legally in 2013 in Washington, D.C., before marriage equality became the law of the land and possible here in Michigan. So I went to law school in 1993 in hopes of finding a stable job uh, and a way to support my family. After graduation from law school, I had the enormous privilege of being hired to serve as a law clerk for a federal judge in Detroit, Judge Bernard Friedman, and he's the judge who would ultimately strike Michigan's marriage law as unconstitutional and whose case would be among the three that reached the Supreme Court in the United States and led to marriage equality throughout the country. I want to pause for a minute and just say something about Judge Friedman. I owe him a debt of gratitude for taking a chance on me. I was an older student. I had done this, uh, been involved in the union work for 12 years between undergrad and graduate school. And uh, students I teach now and students often say to me, my, you took a lot of time off. And I say, no, 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 I wasn't taking time off. I was just living my life. That was my life. It wasn't viewed as a way of getting to the next step. Uh, it was just what I was doing. Uh, but I was an older student. I wasn't the traditional candidate that he was interviewing for a clerkship. And little did he know I was pregnant during the interview. I tried, I hid it as well as I could. I tried to communicate though to Judge Friedman that I was a lesbian uh, because I just didn't want there to be any mistake about that. Uh, I had had some, some difficult experiences with some incidents of, of what would possibly be called discrimination um, and some, some violence and things that had happened and I didn't want there to be a mistake. Uh, but I don't think Judge Friedman picked up on what I was trying to say. <laughs> I learned from, but, but I learned from Judge Friedman something I have never forgotten, which is to be open-minded, to welcome those who are a little different, and that should I ever be in a position to get through a difficult to open door, I would hold it open for others to come through. 
I've lived by those principles ever since, and I've had the enormous privilege to hold the door open to people who have previously not been let in. I know that there are many of you here today who live by this ideal as well. We are the lucky ones. We have come inside, and we have the amazing chance to let others come along with us, which I believe is one of life's greatest privileges. I went on to spend 14, I spent three years with Judge Friedman, and then I spent 14 years as a civil rights lawyer at the United States Department of Justice at the U.S. Attorney's Office in Detroit. Uh, earlier I mentioned to you that my mother was an immigrant and my father was from a family of meager means. I was raised with a critical eye about the inequalities in this country. But when I arrived at the U.S. Attorney's Office and went to court, and stood before the judge on my cases where I was enforcing this country's incredible civil rights laws. And I would begin by saying, my name is Judy Levy and I'm here on behalf of the United States of America. I became a patriot in some ways for the first time. I was proud to be an American and to be able to serve my country to make it a more fair and equal country and ultimately I think a better place for all of us. So far as I was concerned, my work as a federal prosecutor bringing civil rights cases, fair lending, fair housing, including access for support animals, we have an animal in the audi audience here, uh, police misconduct cases, disability rights cases, voting rights, and more, was the greatest honor I could ever have imagined. I'm fond of telling my students, uh, I teach a seminar or two at the U of M Law School, um, that like I have told you, I'm one of the lucky ones. I tell them that, not related to coming out or opening doors for others, be but because I truly, truly believe I have never worked a day in my life. I've had the enormous privilege of spending my days working in, in the sense of work, yes, but engaging with and doing things that matter to me, what I believe will make a positive difference in someone's life and what I hope will make a contribution to our public lives together. Uh, I will end soon, uh, but I first want to tell you just a little bit uh, about how I ended up with this ridiculous title, Your Honor, or simply Judge, instead of my name. Uh, it was the result entirely and exclusively of the kindness and thoughtfulness of others. I, have, I was contacted sitting at my desk in Detroit working on a case by a young lawyer in Washington, D.C. who was working with a progressive social justice oriented organization. He said that his group uh, was aware that there were some vacancies on the federal bench in Detroit. There are about 22 judges, uh, federal judges in the Eastern District of Michigan, which is uh, where uh, the bench that I'm a part of. And his organization had done some phone calling and uh, emailing and things like that to try to come up with some names of candidates in Michigan that they might recommend uh, for the position. And my name had come to their attention. At that time, I almost hung up the phone uh, because this is not something that had ever occurred to me. I was not, as a young child, wishing or hoping or thinking of becoming a federal judge. I did not know lawyers. Uh, and it was nothing that was a part of my life. Uh, but at the time that I got that call, a colleague and friend was in my office, and she encouraged me to keep talking. And the rest is history. I applied for the position. I was interviewed by some 27 lawyers in Detroit. My name was recommended to the White House, and ultimately President Obama nominated me, and I was confirmed by the Senate in March of 2014. I now have a caseload of approximately 200 criminal and civil cases randomly assigned as they come in to any one of the 22 federal judges in the Eastern District of Michigan. And I just want to say some, a little bit about the position and I hope that you'll ask questions of, about anything that's interesting to you. Uh, but one of the things that has been a challenge for me in this position is that just when our country seemed to have a national consensus that we're against mass incarceration, I have become an incarcerator. I conduct civil and criminal trials, I take guilty pleas, and I sentence defendants. 
and do all of the miscellaneous duties that are required uh, for a judge to do. It's an awesome responsibility and one that I welcome. But I don't always feel that I'm the smartest person for the job or the most qualified or the most knowledgeable. In fact, I can assure you I, I am not. But I know that when I enter the courtroom, I give it all that I have and that I welcome everyone who walks into my courtroom with respect and kindness, no matter whether they walk in the front door or through the lockup in handcuffs. And I ensure every, that everyone has their day in court and is heard in a meaningful way. That much I can promise to all of you, and I, I try to promise it to everyone who comes in. Uh, beyond that, I, I believe I have never worked a day in my life, and that as hard as I might work in a certain sense to try to get each case right and to bring fresh eyes and a fair heart to every case, I still don't feel that I'm ever working when I'm uh, on the bench or in the court or, or working on cases. And I realized the other day that sometimes opening doors for others is actually not quite enough. Sometimes you have to hold the door open so that others can see inside for, see inside for a while and begin to develop a dream or an idea that they can live inside where that door leads to. I know that each of you has done that uh, for others. You, you work in such an interesting and novel and uh, important place and opening the door so that others can get a glimpse of what you're able to do here is so important. I'd like to close my remarks with a, a quote from someone I have admired for decades. Maybe uh, you all know as much or more about him than I do. Uh, it's uh, uh, Bayard Rustin. Uh, Mr. Rustin, as you may know, worked tire tirelessly alongside Martin Luther King Jr. and other civil rights activists in the 60s in their common quest for racial equality. I might add that many of the historical accounts of the civil rights movement of the 60s uh, don't mention that Bayard Rustin was gay. Rustin said this on the subject of protesting and fighting for equality. He said, quote, we need in every bay and every community a group of angelic troublemakers. I imagine as I look and see some of you here that you are angelic troublemakers in your own families in this office and in the community, sorry Carl, I'm not trying to make trouble in your office, <laughs> uh, and in your communities. And I think this is a good thing. Change is hard, but it's good, and if it's achieved in an open and honest way, it can be la very lasting uh, and, and make a difference. So I, I thank you for inviting me, and um, that's a little bit of my story, and I'd love to hear any questions you might have or ideas of your own. And I understand that we need to have a microphone for those who have questions, and there's one right there. Oh. <laughs> Hi, thank you. Is this working? Oh, okay. Uh, thank you so much for coming, first of yeah. all. I actually have kind of a two-part question. Um, the first being that, like, if you were walk watching the last presidential debate, we heard the two nominees talk about their strategy for selecting Supreme Court mm. nominees. And um, I found, honestly, both candidates to be very political in what they said. I, you know, Hillary, Trump is whatever, to be <laughs> honest, but Hillary was also saying stuff about how she wanted a candidate who would support abortion and a candidate who would repeal Citizens United. It was a very explicitly political um, description, whereas I feel like President Obama ha selecting Merrick Garland was saying, no, I want someone who just looks at the law fairly and thinks about people, but looks at the law. So I'd love to hear your kind of opinion on the implications of presidential candidates and how they choose their nominees and what they say about their nominating process. Okay. And also just hear about your experience. You know, you were saying balancing the fact that for many years you were a very political and um, activist person, but now you're on a bench where you do have to look at cases sort of yeah. dispassionately and how you've, how you've balanced that. Well, thank you for the question. In terms of um, anything partisan, once I, even though I was selected by President Obama, confirmed by the Senate, once I'm in the position, I am not permitted to make any uh, partisan remarks or comments. I can vote, but only if 
it's not a caucus where Democrats go in this door and Republicans go in this door. Uh, I cannot fundraise and I'm not supposed to comment in any way on uh, candidates that would favor one or another. But I don't see your question as asking, did I like the way one candidate defined who they would nominate? The, the only thing I can say is I, I listen to some of those remarks and, and I have a feeling a campaign is very different from reality and that when it comes down to it, the, the process may look very different once a candidate is in the position. I know that President Obama made remarks that uh, he thought that the bench should be more diverse than it is. Um, and he, he was talking about qualities he was looking for in judges as opposed to a specific position that they might take on a case. Um, so that's probably all that I can uh, say really in, in response to the first part of your question. Uh, in terms of the process itself, um, the, it's such an interesting process because you're not supposed to say if presented with uh, a case by a union, would you rule in favor of the union? You <laughs> know, something like that. Um, but, the, but the process is still one designed to figure out if you in some way share um, the, the philosophy that the administration that would be appointing you is looking for. And I, and I, I can't really say what President Obama's judicial philosophy is, but I know what was communicated to me was the idea that I would have an open mind, that I would bring my life experiences, which may not be the same as um, people who have not experienced some of the, the things that I've experienced. I had an incident where uh, my then partner, now spouse, and I lived in an apartment on West Hoover Street here in Ann Arbor. The apartment manager was coming home drunk, getting ready to uh, physically assault his wife and I opened our door and to see if I needed to call the police. He turned on us and used uh, very sexist and vulgar and anti-gay epithets and some racist epithets against us and physically attacked us. My uh, spouse went to the hospital with uh, blood coming down her eye. We both went to the hospital. Um, so I've had those, I've been a crime victim in that sense. Um, and had s other experiences that the, the White House was aware of by the time my application got there. Uh, and I think that went into the selection, is saying here's somebody who, when a litigant comes in the door, won't see things through uh, a lens of not understanding what can happen in life and what harm can befall people. So I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah, You're welcome. Yeah. First of all, thank you so much for coming. Oh, uh, glad to be here. Really excited to have you. Um, my question centered around, um, you know, now that LGBT uh, or gay marriage is now legal across the country, like there's still a lot of progress to be made. Mm -hmm. What do you think are the most important issues um, whether legal or political right now for the LGBT community? You know, that's an interesting question. And in terms of legal issues, I know that uh, there is not protection for uh, lesbian and gay people or uh, people with fluid gender identities and that sort of thing uh, in the workplace. Um, some states and some cities and some counties have passed ordinances and, and that sort of thing. But there is no national protection <coughs> and uh, built into the, our country's civil rights laws. And that just seems like such an important thing uh, for everyone to have, some kind of protection against discrimination on the job. There are ways that some of the existing statutes are being uh, litigated. Uh, these issues are being litigated under current existing laws. and. Um, trying to see whether they can fit this issue into sex discrimination prohibitions and things like that. Um, so so that, that's what comes to my mind is the importance of the workplace in terms of all. We spend so much time at work, uh, all of us do in this country, and 
to, to not know that you can be safe at work coming out if your employer holds some sort of bias or animus is, is worrisome. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> oh. <laughs> um, so in uh, your presentation, you talked about mass incarceration yeah. um, and kind of mandatory minimum sentences. And I was wondering if you could kind of expand on that. And then I've also read in some cases where judges have actually gone and visited those folks that they've sentenced. Uh -huh. um, and I'm wondering if you've ever done that sort of outreach um, to the folks that you've seen in your courtroom. Yeah, that's a good question. Well, in terms of this whole issue of um, mass incarceration, there are so many possible reasons for it that our prison population has exploded. Um, and uh, mandatory minimums. So I, I have some cases that come to me where I have no choice but to sentence someone to, uh, generally th there's a five year mandatory minimum in a good number of cases that I have, 10 and 20 year mandatory minimums for people who are uh, considered to be armed career criminals or career criminals. Uh, some of those are drug, re drug, case, drug law related. Uh, and um, it is a very painful thing. One of the things that's important to me in sentencing is to look very, uh, is to have the conversation with the defendant, not with the prosecutor, not with the defendant's lawyer, but to be able to talk to the person I'm sentencing and to look into his or her eyes, and mostly it's his eyes, but there are some female defendants, uh, and make sure that I am able to communicate to them what this sentence is and why. And there has been at least, there's been more than one, but one case where I truly did not believe, there was a mandatory minimum, that this person should face more than two to three months. And I had no choice but to sentence him to five years, and it was not a just and fair sentence, which I'm required to, uh, under the f sentencing laws, I'm required to impose a just and fair sentence that is sufficient, this is the law, but not greater than necessary to achieve the objectives of, of the law. And I couldn't do that. Um, but, but, I still, but I had to do it, I can't, I, I had to do it. Uh, in terms of visiting people, there are several federal judges who have done that. It has come under some legal criticism of would you learn something, I don't know, I don't really understand what the criticism is. I haven't done it. Uh, I'm new enough at this that um, I, I just sort of had, haven't gotten enough free space in my mind even to think about how to do that. In the federal system, there are beds just like any other system, but they're all over the country. And we have a federal prison in Milan, Michigan, but it's a medium to low security prison. And so our, it does not, it has a medical facility, but it's not for people with specific medical or mental health issues. A lot of the defendants I sentence are dispersed all over the country. And so it's not as easy as just driving to Milan and, and talking to people. Uh, but I'm very interested in prisoner reentry and trying to get connected. There's two judges in Detroit who are working on meeting prisoners, uh, defendants, as they come back into the community. And so it's my hope to spend some time with that project. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I actually wanted to jump off um, Carl's question. Uh, one, I wanted to know, um, do you have any uh, levers internally to uh, either express displeasure or uh, basically annotate or measure how often you are handing out a sentence that is uh, required but that you feel is sort of not within your no. discretion? And then second, I would just jump off maybe your uh, community organizing experience. I think that the issue is something that's uh, galvanizing but sort of difficult from a community perspective to know exactly where the levers are uh -huh. and if you have any insights on sort of as citizens where, where, where the soft points are within that to create system. more change? Yes, yeah. Uh-huh. Well, for, thank you. First of all, on the sentencing issue, um, I'm keeping track uh, in a Excel 
spreadsheet. Is that a Google product? There's somebody else. <laughs> okay, no. Okay, sorry. Not uh, it, so, some sort of thing. I'm keeping track of it. it um, and uh, because it is such an emotionally taxing and exhausting uh, process to sentence somebody, and um, I don't even trust myself to remember carefully enough. So I have a chart that has the name, the sentencing guidelines that are the, what the United States Sentencing Commission recommends the sentence be. And then if I have discretion, which the vast majority of cases I can go dramatically below and above, I have to articulate the reasons on the record or I'll be reversed. But um, I, I am consistently sentencing at least below and sometimes significantly below the sentencing guidelines, but our sentences in the federal system are enormously long. So even saying that I'm set sentencing people generally below the guidelines by articulating the reasons for that uh, is to say I'm regularly imposing five and six and seven and ten year sentences. Um, so I do put the reasons on the record. I also put a small uh, paragraph in the judgment that's entered that can be studied by anybody who, who wants to, um, what the reasons are for going below uh, what the Sentencing Commission recommends. Um, s and and I, I keep track of it all. Uh, in the one instance where I thought that the uh, mandatory minimum and the way the case was charged, it's not just the mandatory minimums. Prosecutors have charging decisions to charge somebody with a crime that has a minimum or not charge them with something lesser, where there's uh, the whole thing disturbed me profoundly and I still see his face. I close my eyes and I can see many of these defendants' faces and um, it just disturbs me terribly so I, so I keep, keep track of it somewhat that way as well. Um, in terms of areas for, for change, one thing, this is just my personal I um, was very involved as a civil rights lawyer in fair housing litigation in trying, uh, in the Detroit metropolitan area we have uh, one of the most racially segregated uh, communities in our country. Every now and then Milwaukee be beats us out, sometimes Chicago beats us out, but Detroit's always competing for the top, the Detroit metropolitan area. and. Um, there has got to be something that can be done to increase racial and other diversity in people's neighborhoods and make access to housing fair in this country. Um, and this isn't even touching upon affordable housing, but so it, it's an, an issue that just deeply worries me when I see how the, the racial, di if you ever go on Alter Road on the east side of Detroit, you've got Detroit here, you've got Alter Road, you've got Gross Point. On one side of the street there are black people walking, on the other side there are only white people walking. There are white businesses on one side, black businesses on the other side. And there is something going on to make sure that people don't cross that street. And uh, those things just worry me about our country and about access to education and jobs and transportation and health care and food and um, just the basics. But So I, I just hope that people will keep focused on that and uh, look at ways to support ordinances that in increase housing opportunities and strengthen penalties for people who violate fair housing laws. I don't, it's not that easy to figure out how to do these things, but those things concern me a lot. Yeah. Um, I wanted to go back to a point that you made earlier about how there were instances where the uh, minimum sentencing for somebody was much greater than what you actually thought was fitting with your um, judicial obligation to issue just and fair and not excessive sentences. Mm -hmm. um, I was curious how those kind of inconsistencies pop up where a minimum sentence is in direct contradiction to what you consider to be a judicial responsibility. I, I assume that situations like that arise from 
um, someone thinking that you know a certain minimum sentence is what is required for well, that crime, but then what's the process when it starts to become apparent that that's not the case? That's a good question because the way the mandatory minimums get uh, come about is Congress. Congress passes a law saying um, if you've had two prior drug offenses and a third, then you're a career criminal, and so a mandatory 10 years or whatever the statute might say, and then the person gets charged with that crime is most certainly guilty of the crime, pleads guilty in open court, and then I have no choice but to sentence them. In between the guilty plea and the sentencing, I get something phenomenal that I wish I could share with the world, but they're confidential, which is called a pre-sentence report, where we have an incredible probation department that goes out to the defendant's homes, interviews the defendant, family members, teachers, all sorts of people get interviewed to determine, to tell me the history and characteristics of this individual. Who is this person? And I read those, I was reading two of them last night actually, and I just, I just wanted to shred it because one of them was someone who's being, uh, who would pled guilty to being a felon in possession of a firearm. Those, uh, the sentencing guidelines for being a felon in possession of a firearm are enormously high. And we have a serious violent crime problem in Detroit, and so I don't fault anyone for trying to resolve that. But I, I read his pre-sentence report, and this individual was born to a family with serious and profound mental health problems for the mother and the father addiction problems, violence problems. Half of his family is in prison. The other half are marginally not employed in the legal market, uh, legal economy. And uh, he stopped uh, going to school in sixth grade. He, uh, I mean, his, his conviction, he had a criminal conviction at seven years old for receipt of stolen property, which is a bicycle that somebody gave him. He's a six-year-old, and that's, I'm to take that into consideration in sentencing. Then he had a conviction at 13, at 15, at 16. It just goes on and now. And so, so that's how it comes to my attention. Okay, yes, you violated this law, but nothing in our society, we are all responsible for this. We did not support this young man. This child did not have the basic necessities of daily life. And now I'm facing uh, a decision about what's appropriate for him. And I'm just left with thinking our mental health care system is deficient and devoid of real meaningful options. The just physical health care, this young man didn't have food as a child. Uh, and the educational system couldn't accommodate his disability, cognitive impairments. And he goes out and commits crimes. So that leads to a disconnect that the solution is now for him to spend many of his formative early adult years in prison. So it, it comes to me through that route. So, yeah. I just want to ask a quick question. Sure. Um, what sort of advice would you have for, for a young person or maybe a young lawyer um, who'd maybe worked in public interest before now mm -hmm. in the private sector and kind of trying to find some direction um, and what advice from your career? You know, um, one thing is to have an open mind about what, uh, what might help you um, or that person develop in the direction they want to go. For instance, when I got um, hired at the U.S. Attorney's Office, I was interested in doing civil rights work, and the position I got hired for was not that position. I ultimately worked my way into creating the position. It didn't exist, and then doing it. But I got hired to defend the government when it was sued in civil litigation. I worked to keep people who were undocumented out of the country for the first year. It wasn't work that I, my heart was in, but I saw that I could learn litigation. I could get the kind of support and direction and training that I needed to be a good lawyer. And then I found a way within that system to say, to pitch these ideas of what we could really do. So one thing is just to 
keep a really open mind. Sometimes a corporate law firm is the best step to getting training so you can get where you want to go. Um, so that's not very concrete. But I always really, the students I work with at the U of M Law School, I really encourage them to keep really close tabs on what, what they care about the most so that they don't lose sight of that while they're taking these steps that might get them there. Yeah. Um, I'm curious about your thoughts on the mechanism of the preemptory challenge uh, uh -huh. and how that relates to uh, racial disparity and to access specifically to uh, a fair trial. And it, it's something that's just like uh, an interest or curiosity for me. And I try to wrap my mind around uh -huh. the mechanism and whether we're dealing with something that is the um, the best of a lot of bad options, or if you were given the chance to uh, design a different jury selection process, what you would do. Oh, that's interesting. So for those who aren't familiar with peremptory challenges, when you select a jury, you um, each side can, can ask that jurors be struck for cause. Um, Carl lives on Fair Street. This thing took place on Fair Street. He can't possibly be fair about Fair Street. <laughs> so, and so I'd say, yeah, that makes sense. You, we're going to thank and excuse you because you can't uh, be an unbiased juror in this case. And once that's done, then the lawyers for both sides get a certain number of just fr free challenges. Just their own gut tells them, so-and-so, I don't want so-and-so on my jury. And in that instance, you are entirely relying on bias and stereotype. You've met the juror for all of 20 minutes. You've asked some basic questions. And you have this feeling as a lawyer that there's something going on that I can't put my finger on. And I don't think that person should be on this jury. And there are su there's Supreme Court law that says you can do it for no reason at all. You can do it for your personal reason. You can strike these people, but you can't do it based on race, sex, religion, maybe. And the Attorney General, uh, Obama's last Attorney General, and it's continued into this Attorney General, said <coughs> DOJ lawyers are prohibited from striking people based on sexual orientation and gender identity. But there's no law on that as a at the Supreme Court level, at least, yet. But um, I'd be a little bit loath to get rid of the peremptory challenge process because uh, really all of jury selection is about stereotypes and biases. And it's a terrible thing to say, but you don't have much time. And you have to just get a sense of the person's posture, whether they're mumbling, whether they're looking straight at. You have nothing to go on. Uh, and in criminal cases, your liberty is in their hands. And so um, it's, it's sort of the only, like, it's just sort of a safeguard we have if you feel that the person could potentially be unstable or sh something like that. Um, I work pretty hard to avoid cause strikes for my juror permitting people, uh, lawyers, to strike jurors for cause when I suspect it's a discriminatory animus. And I'll s we, we had a, a case of two um, Pakistani Muslims uh, on trial for a uh, very serious uh, federal criminal case. And there was a Muslim juror. Well, uh, you know, actually, I didn't, never asked him his religion, but he worked at a mosque, and his family went to the mosque. I don't, it sort of gave me the feeling that possibly he was a member of that <laughs> congregation. Uh, and uh, there was some, well, I don't know if he should be, yes, he can be on this jury. That's not a reason for him not to be on this jury. Uh, and he did serve on the jury, and the defendants were found guilty on all counts. Um, and he didn't seem to hesitate to vote for guilt. Um, so, so I try to do my part in rooting out anything that might be discriminatory, uh, have a discriminatory motive, um, and then sort of let the lawyers do their part. Sure. Yeah. Hi. <coughs> Quick question for you. Thanks for joining us today, by the way. Um, kind of taking a more like macro look at a lot of the topics you've talked about here today, um, I really love 
how kind of like positive and how um, you see your work as not really even being work. Um, and just hearing some about your background, um, sexual orientation, things mm -hmm. that have happened against you in your life that, you know, really are unique and, and could affect different people in different ways. What do you credit um, in your life that helps you have such a kind of high level view on things and, and really just being able to see things in a, in a very clear and, and positive light? Oh, well, that's nice of you to say. Um, <laughs> but I, I appreciate your question just because of you know, what you said in your question. Um, I don't know, I've just, I, I don't know. I've got great, I had great parents uh, and I've got a brother and sister who are really great and friends and um, family. I've got the three really great kids who keep me really uh, going <laughs> a lot. <laughs> um, uh, so I'm not really sure, except that I just feel like I have been so fortunate to have opportunities um, that others haven't had and I just don't want to mess up. And, and, and not take advantage of the opportunities. So I wish I could answer your question better. So, yeah, thank you though. Hi, thank you for coming. Um, I just had a really quick question about, I know you've worked a lot in the LGBT space. Uh -huh. And I'm actually, um, I'm an LGBT and I came from Florida, which I'm sure as you know is not the most opening yeah, place. Yeah. Um, and so for people here in Ann Arbor, it must seem like, hey, you know, things are going in the right direction and things are going great, but I have a lot of friends in Florida um, who, you know, they're constantly, you know, the laws could change any day yeah. and they could be under a state which is very highly Republican run um, and could go under, you know, obviously issues so my question stems from the fact that you've worked with both the, I mean, from being a, a, a lawyer in the DOJ and being um, now a, a district attorney, or I mean a, a judge, uh -huh. um, do you feel that that could happen, that any day the administration could change and then the laws could become back to where they were? Or do you feel there's enough legal precedence now to where that'd be really hard to uh, redo the direction that we've gone in? You know, I think your question is really important because I always hear, well, now that we have marriage equality, everything's okay for the gay people. And I don't feel like everything's okay for the gay people. Um, and try, like, I still try to figure out, is it okay to be affectionate with my spouse in public sometimes? Here in Ann Arbor, I still, ha there's sometimes a hesitation just to figure out, just to look around and make sure things are okay. Um, and so I feel like even if we don't so, sort of suddenly have repressive laws, that we still have a long way to go to bring people along to be fully uh, embraced and welcomed and um, considered to be equal and healthy uh, and normal or typical or whatever word we're gonna use. So, and I do think that there are uh, areas where votes are being taken up to limit LGBT. Well, all of the bathroom bills of who can go to the bathroom, for God's sake, um, in which bathroom. And so I think there are laws being passed that are repressive and are trying to push back. Uh, so and so I, I think it is possible for those things to happen. I think it's also so wonderful that there's enough of a movement to respond to that. And even with the North Carolina bathroom bill, the Department of Justice says no, our government says that's not okay. Uh, so there's, when we see these pushing back, there's also pushing forward. So, so I think that's, there's a lot of room to be optimistic at least. Uh, all right, uh, final question here. Um, <laughs> Um, thank you so much for coming in today um, and imparting your knowledge upon us. I have uh, just a quick question. Um, with Colin Kaepernick, Ka Kaepernick right now is doing a lot of protesting uh, for some issues that are, are, are pretty prevalent here within the country. And I was wondering from your perspective, what can we do to impact things in the legal realm um, to start making things a little bit better uh, instead of maybe being out here uh, taking a knee <laughs> during the national anthem? <laughs> you know what? I really think 
think if I look at two legal cases, bear with me for just a minute. We had Bowers versus Hardwick in 1980, what, four, six? 1986. I got a couple of law clerks that yeah. <laughs> came with me. Okay, and that's where the Supreme Court said that uh, there was a challenge to uh, Georgia's sodomy laws, that um, there is no right to homosexual sodomy and all this sort of language was used in there, insulting language, that that's what it was really about. And the laws were upheld as constitutional. Fast forward 12 or so years and we get Lawrence versus Texas and it comes out the other way with language about love and family. And what happened between Bowers and Lawrence? Protesting happened. People took the knee, so to speak, on behalf of lesbian and gay rights and there was a huge effort in small towns and big towns and in Ann Arbor and in Detroit to change people's hearts and minds and the Supreme Court saw it very differently. And the language that was used just to litigate Bowers or uh, Lawrence versus the earlier language about a r fundamental right to sodomy, nobody wants a fundamental right to sodomy. That's not what we're talking about. <laughs> and I mean, many do, I do, but I just, all I'm saying is that's, so, so I think those protests really impact the legal uh, climate. Um, you know, yesterday I was just in court and a uh, defendant wanted to be let out on bond in a big marijuana case. Like, I mean, capital B, capital I, capital G, that much marijuana <laughs> going <laughs> around the country. And uh, at an earlier hearing, I did not let him out, and I said, you know, he has access to enough money to purchase a small country in terms of whether he would flee or not, and that likelihood of fleeing. But at this hearing, the, uh, his lawyer brought me a case from New Mexico with different facts and stuff, but whatever. Um, and it said, you know what? Marijuana is now legal in Colorado. Colorado's near us. I think I'm going to let this defendant out uh, pending trial. And here's a situation where, and uh, this all seems disconnected, and that's why I told you I get distracted. But in my mind, it's connected because there's been social change that has impacted the le our opinions about marijuana and whether it should be uh, illegal or not. And that impacts what happens inside little courtrooms all over the country, even though you don't know it, that that's going on. Well, thank you all. Thank you.